All right, Ellis Cinema back. Another dish. How we doing out there? Good, great, great, and, and wonderful. As you see on your screen, your dial, however you're cho choosing to join us today, we appreciate you. Takeout, takeout, starring Seth Landau, Kevin Kolb, Judd Oman, Yenny Alvarez, Daniel Roebuck, Justin Walker, Carrie Maroney, and more. Edited by Greg Robbins, music by Dan Silver, cinematography by Vincent Pascal. I probably ruined that. Pasco, Pascal. Anyway, Takeout is a biting out of chain restaurants satire about that's so fucking stupid. I don't know why I wrote that. Taking it is a biting satire about Zach Turk, a reporter that gets voluntold to be a food critic for the Arizona Tribune. Zach starts pounding the pavement, shedding light on the sad truth behind chain restaurants. Newsflash. They're fucking bad. All of them. And they haven't gotten any better, if you ask me. If like we're talking when this movie was made until now, nothing, ain't shit changed. Ain't shit changed. I tell you what. Anyway, uh, but you probably wouldn't, uh, you know, take advice from, you probably wouldn't listen to me. Like, uh, there's no way he doesn't eat fast food look at him he's fat as hell he probably eats fast food all the time no i actually look this way because i house a rack of oreos every night that's it i don't i don't really frequent the fast foods not that we're going to you know do any bashing here on the show we might never can tell what's going to happen between me and our guests which i i hope you like him i know that we our past shows have gotten amongst some of the most listens that we've had um but anyway today on the show Scoring a hat trick of appearances, similar to Dean Youngblood, hat trick of appearances, uh, and also rare territory. I usually don't have people on more than twice is kind of my limit unless I really enjoy talking to the person. And I talk to this dude off mic, you know, in my free time. So it's not always business, which is why. Uh, getting him on today, it, it's a pleasure for me. And he, I, I tell you what, he's insightful. He gives you a perspective that you may not know about. Anyway, members of the audience, producer, actor, writer, and director of Takeout, Seth Landau joining the Ellis Cinema podcast for the third time, my friend. Hooray. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for having me back. Appreciate it. Always a great time. How are you this doing, my be friend? You doing awesome. Awesome. <laughs> How I mean, are you? I'm good. Last time you and I talked uh, that was on the mic, we I think we did something unprecedented. If you're asking, if you ask me, we did a three hour and some change review on Youngblood, which is a 80s film and <laughs> an 80s hockey film. I don't think that's that's never been done to that point, And it's never going to be done is what I think. I'll go. I'll take that to my grave. Absolutely. I time still well spent. Thank yeah. you. Yes, I I would still tell like my stepdad who loves hockey, loves the movie Youngblood. He's just mm -hmm. like, yeah, I'm on. It's been what like a year since we've done that one, and he's like, yeah, I'm I'm about at the hour and a half mark. I'm about at the two hour mark. I'll get there. Fair. I'll get there. Fair. So take out, sir. This this has some history behind it. This this is this has come. This is a long time coming before uh, the audience. You can see this for free now on Tubi on Tubi for free. No fucking excuse. But you made this film back in 2005, sir. And now it's getting the streaming release that it deserves. How in the hell were you that fucking patient? Um. I was forced to be patient. Uh, so so I, I wanted to get this movie in the book of Guinness, uh, Guinness Book of World Records for taking the longest amount of time from wrap of production, post-production to release. Because sometimes in the indie space, you get maybe like a year or two or three or four or five, maybe six, not whatever this has been, what, 17? Something along, almost two decades. So we shot it in 04. We wrap post-production in 2005. At first, IMDb was confused because they made it a 20. It was released last year, finally, 2022. So yeah. IMDb says take out 2022. 
because why else would a movie be on 20 on Tubi and Amazon or whatever else it was on uh, it, that was that old? So the the tech Narati was uh, was tricked and now it's back to being properly listed as 2005. So um, at the time, uh, I was inspired by the independent cinema stars of the time, Robert Rodriguez, Kevin Smith, et cetera. A lot of these guys were doing low budget film that was heavy on content and not necessarily loaded with a B or even C list stars. So in this world that we live in today, it has to be a known property. The IP has to be strong and has to have movie stars, et cetera, or a pop star or something. Right. So back in the day when people were making that phrase, the IP has to be right. God, what the hell is happening to us? I know what I'm saying. Why did I even, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I apologize for using jargon, but um, it, so I was inspired by those, you know, micro budget filmmakers who ostensibly got by on the strength of their content. Now, was that the case or was that a publicly spun story? Who knows? They probably had some friends behind the scene and some pieces of the machine working for them. But me on the outside, not going to film school, not coming from a Hollywood family, even though the name Landau is all over Hollywood, not, none of my Landau's. Um, oh, actually, OK, so quick story. When I first moved to L.A., I called some of the Landau's to see if they would have coffee with me just on the strength of my name. Ridiculous, I know, but you get desperate when you move to LA and you're poor and you're in a $1,200 bachelor pad in Westwood with no job and you got to figure shit out, right? So I called James Cameron's producer, John Landau, and I played it kind of cool. I called, um, what is it? Uh, their, their office in Santa Monica, I forget the name, Lightstorm. So I called Lightstorm and I talked to John Landau's assistant and I said, hey, uh, I'm wondering if John would meet with me to talk about, you know, just, uh, you know, some productions, movies. I, I want I, at the time I was an actor. I wanted to get in front of people who could cast and hopefully throw me a bone. So she said, oh, yeah, sure. Um, Seth, because, I, you know, Seth Landau. Um, absolutely. Uh, is I forget the day, but like what is Wednesday at noon? Good. Sure. And then that was it. And she hung up. I'm like, all right, I'll see you there at this day and this time. Right. I'm like, I can't believe how easy that was. That was amazing. Five minutes later, I got a call back and she says, yeah, um, what did you want to talk to John about? And then I got to explain myself. She realized I wasn't related. She said, no, we're not going to give you a meeting. But if you want to submit a script or something at the time, I did. I wasn't a writer, but I, I thought of can I whip something up. If you want to submit a script or something, you can send it to our development and they'll look at it. Uh, anyway, so. Yeah, Made Takeout was inspired by the independent filmmakers of the day who did micro-budget stuff with no stars. I did the same thing, although I was lucky to have a pretty strong cast in mind, even though it was literally like a $13,000 movie, so those reports are true. A lot of reports about movies are not. That is actually true. Um, after it was done, we had a screening in Hollywood, and we invited friends and family. Uh, it went really well, and I remember certain people telling me at the time, yeah, you know, we think this is going to get bought or distributed, whatever. They, it, the... The emotions were very positive at the time. Just, you know, I guess the content fit the time and, you know, the audience response was pretty good. I remember to this day places where that audience laughed in in the picture. Um, and then I proceeded to submit it to every film festival, almost every single one of them said no. So it was it was rejected by nearly every film festival. Um, I then just jumped to distributors and I, I submitted it to every single distributor and some of them were semi-interested. In fact, I remember the Weinstein com company in particular wrote me back. And usually they're they're pretty close to the vest. They don't really release anything when they say no because they don't want it to be used against them, either legally or publicity or anything really. But the guy said something like, hey, this is really funny, but it doesn't have stars in it. We can't do anything with this. And Think Film, a couple other ones of the time had a cut. Rarely will I even grant you that. Usually when you submit material in Hollywood, again, mainly for probably legality purposes, they can't say anything other than thank you, no. Or they won't even look at it unless it's solicited. So um, I was, for whatever that is worth, lucky enough to get a little bit of positive feedback, but essentially rejected by everybody, even though some of the people who saw it, whether it was an advanced review or something like that, at the time I sent it out, to a few of the blogosphere people and they they really liked it it just didn't have the star power i kind of missed that wave where you know let's say it's good for the sake of this podcast um but like good good content minus 
really famous people has a shot to be mass distributed in Hollywood. I, I miss that boat. I mean, like swingers, clerks, El Mariachi. I, I was making this past 2000. I'm at 04, 05, 06. The industry was already starting to change to where it is today, where it is just completely a machine. Those already days of the 60s and 70s, independent sentiments, et cetera. It's just, it's much different. I feel like I kind of caught that changeover right at the wrong time. And uh, basically what happened was it just sat there. I uploaded it to YouTube, low def SD version in about 2012 or so. At that time, there weren't a bunch of free full length movies on YouTube. So it has over half a million views on YouTube from that time because it was a bigger deal. He's, here's a new movie for free on YouTube. In 2012, that was not common. Today it is. So I think because of that and, be, and the comments on the movie, it's still on my YouTube page to this day. I, I left it there. I actually, I made it dark when this premiered. And then a year after this premiered, I, I like, I turned the lights back on it because it's like, nobody's going to watch this shitty SD version of my movie when they can go for free right now and watch it on Tubi. Right. Um, but you can see the comments on it from back in the day. I mean, like I really felt gratified that the way that people responded to it was exactly how the movie was supposed to connect with people. Uh, and then the reason why it's out there now in a professional way is because the other movie I made around that same time, Brian loves you was given the blue Blu-ray release. And clearly you've seen that because we've done a show on it and it's behind you. Um, <laughs> and, and the distributor said, who's very independent filmmaker friendly. Um, he said, Hey, whatever happened with takeout because he had heard of it way back when I said, nothing. He said, let's put it out there. So here we are. Thanks to Brian loves you. Takeout has life. Well, so the big question, because I so I and I and I'm, I'm sure I'm probably wrong, but I I actually think it didn't get picked up because you went after people, man. I think I think that this was one of those things where people were like, Ugh. I, I yes, of, of course, we it doesn't have star power, so we can't make it like I understand that. But I also think maybe and maybe you do maybe you don't i don't know if you realize how biting of a satire you made sir like and and i guess i'll lead into this question why i mean why the subject matter uh was this something that you felt strongly about at by the way that's my favorite part of the movie i don't i, I know that's that so funny you always get the nuance <laughs> i tell you what ella cinema that that is fascinating to me. most people don't get my new show or nuance Dude, like I still like and I even like we were talking about, you know, our 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 new uh, girlfriends earlier and mm -hmm. and like I rewound it and like like, oh, this is my favorite part of the fucking movie. Like, I don't know if this just something That's about funny. how it's fucking delivered. But anyway, why this was this something at the time in your life that you were going through or was it just something that you wanted to tackle? And when it, when I say going through was like, were you just like like a vegan where you just like, I don't eat the <laughs> rest? <laughs> are you a crazy vegan? <laughs> <laughs> are you are you one of those crazy? Vegans? Um, but like, was it something? So actually. Oh, no, you froze. Are we here? No, we're there? still okay. here. We'll just keep the audio room. And I what the best wrong. part I'm gonna, is, I'm going to fill the space while you come back to me because you're frozen. Oh, um, see, you're frozen. And let me and know if this is coming through. But uh, before I answer that question, uh, okay, now you're back. Did you hear me that whole time? The whole time. And the best part was okay. you froze on you like this. Laugh. That's you. Yeah, laughing. You were like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, as long as the, the people, as long as the masses can hear us, we'll keep yes, it going yes. if we freeze because this is for them after all. Yes. Uh, okay, so good question. I will get to that real quick. Shout out to the new girl. Hi, Kitty. Um, but something about her watching of Takeout that I think is interesting is she she's not like a she's more into true crime, as mentioned, you know, before we started the show. She's not hugely in the comedies like I am, although we laugh a lot. But for some reason in cinema for her doesn't connect as much as it does for me. And uh, she watched Takeout and she liked it. But as a filmmaker and as a creator, as an artist, I think anybody can relate to this. Um, when you make something and somebody that you know and or care about watches it, you're really on like, you know, like on edge when you get the feedback. You de you so desperately want them to have a deep under uh, appreciation or understanding kind of like you do, uh, but not everybody is an Ella cinema. And so she said, yeah, I thought it was funny. And I'm like, and, and she's like, she, she, she said, I like the part where the girl at the restaurant said there was cum in the CD player. And I said, dude, that's exactly what my chick said, dude. <laughs> that's funny. 
she had the exact same comment that that was what she liked about takeout that one part where no, was, no the uh, one part like so we were talking about it and i wasn't going to get into this but i actually had like a little mini viewing party for this movie the other night i had a interesting few, well thank you a, that's very I, kind I, I had a few friends i was going to save this towards the end but you know how we do we you and i just kind of get it's going free but, flowing but, uh, well, I had people over and after we had had. So first of all, uh, something that you should know about my movie nights, um, when everybody comes in, I always say, hey, when the credits roll, you need to get the fuck out of my house. Like, it's just <laughs> like the show. Yeah, yeah. There's something about you and you have a hard time ending things. You want people to just disappear. <laughs> yes. Yes. Including myself, including myself. But it, this was one of those times where I had said that in the beginning, like when everybody walked in, I was like, hey, I'm going to show you. Um, this dude I know, I mean, he's going to be coming on my show. He's been on my show before, blah, blah, blah. But mm -hmm. it's the film that he did. Anyway, they watched the film. First of all, everybody's laughing, which is when really? I really, oh my yeah. God, it's so cool to hear. Well, not only that dude, but they were laughing consistently. And I guess that's where really, I, wow. I kind of, yeah, it holds I kind up, of, huh? It, it holds up. It, well, in, in this is for real. These are people who have no emotional connection to me or the movie or anything. They just nope. literally saw it and liked it and they watched it. Nope. I mean, my chick does not listen to any of my podcasts, but I, but I also think that that's just because, like, if you hear me, this moment, the yeah. moment where you told me that your friends <laughs> laughed at my movie. I mean, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. They, they laughed at your movie. And but but I think what surprised me the most is that they laughed consistently throughout it. Not sure. to say that it's not funny, because to me, it surprised me because the movie wasn't that funny. But for some reason, they were laughing, I, kidding, joking, joking. So for me, I, I just thought, well, I think it's funny because and I don't it, it, hopefully you don't take this as a dig. But to me, it was a 90 minute SNL sketch. A I've heard I've better. heard that. So so the movie's 18 years old. I've definitely heard that at least once or twice. But to me, it's still it still worked. And then sure. when I saw them watch it, because like I was almost, I guess, like maybe even subconsciously watching it on your behalf, you know, like. Yeah. Like I, I I'm sitting in the set today and everybody was laughing and I could tell this is this is when I knew that the movie was legit. They were actual laughs because like sometimes yeah, I'll yeah. bring I'll bring people over. I'll show them like an old cheesy 80s horror film or whatever. And I'm laughing and you'll get a lot mm. of like, uh -huh, uh -huh, you know, like it's not it's not their thing. But supportive laugh, yeah. laughter, supportive laughter. Exactly. But here is what I think really turned the tide is that when the credits rolled, it sparked a conversation about how I mean, it, it, not that it was an intellectual conversation, but we basically <laughs> went on for 15, 20 minutes about fuck the rich, fuck these chains, blah, blah, blah. And then that's when I was like, I don't know if Seth knows just like and that's why i'm saying like maybe like not blackballed's not the word but like when people Funny. saw this they were blackball like, before i even become any name whatsoever that's what i'm saying is <laughs> the like the first non-famous person to be blackballed but that's kind of how i felt is like if they're feeling about mm. this now two decades later and they're going yeah man I, to me that means when people saw this they were like yeah it's funny okay it may not have stars but we can't ruffle any feathers with this uh -huh. And I still think that you do 20 years later. I still think that this ruffles feathers The the only thing that bums me out is that not a lot has changed since then. You know, like we're it's still well, about the dollar. It's still people are people haven't changed, you know, throughout history. They're pretty much the same. Yeah. And that and I I remember thinking like after everybody had went home or whatever, going, did Seth make something that was so good that people were like, that's it. <laughs> it was too good to be distributed that's why every Print festival it. turned it down but that's what i think dude like i'm not just listen i i i, I think you know my tendency to blow smoke I, I don't know if you've listened to the other shows i wouldn't but like i, I do i'm pretty i'm pretty straightforward with my with my uh reviews or takes on shit because i hate to call mm. myself a critic i really do but i i'm i feel like at best i'm pr so. I definitely wouldn't say you're PR. I would say you're an analyst or um, a researcher. Well, uh, that yeah, I do. I do do some research, but that's when I kind of went, and and I don't. Between takeout and Brian loves you, it kind of upsets me that we don't talk about you more often. Because and here's why: take the fucking money out of the mix. I think it's 
the your perspective and your take on stuff. So let's rein it back into takeout. There is yeah. multiple times in there where not only your humor, your humor is specifically for me. Like, I mean, whether it be, you know, like going to the hostess that uh, your girlfriend, like you just go, um, hi. And like waiting <laughs> yeah. to be, to be greeted. And it's to stuff, this day, I do that. Like it, and it, that dry delivery will always work for, well, I shouldn't say will always work. It depends on who's fucking doing it, but you're, yeah. you're doing it, sir. You're, you're the, like making me laugh consistently throughout, which I had also wrote down here and we're spiraling out of control as I usually do. I kind of am upset that I don't see you acting more. If I'm being honest with you, I'm going to put you on the spot. I'm kind of, that, that. That, that kind of annoys me, man. Well, I appreciate it. When I first moved to LA, I, I wanted to be an actor. The reason why I got into producing things is because it's just not sustainable. I mean, unless you're somebody's um, relative, friend, whatever, there are only so many roles. And even back then, I mean, I remember a lot of the things. I, you're lucky if you even get to audition for TV and, and, and film. Uh, and these days, probably like, uh, you know, web as well. But like back then, I mean, like commercial was what everybody got to audition for. And there was like an abundance of that as far as auditions and agents and actors, but not jobs. Still hard to get a commercial gig and paid much better than film. Um, and uh, like the the like the highest level is going to be film and TV. Everybody wanted a theatrical agent. Very few people ha had it. And even if you do or don't, you get in a door to interview. Um, you're lucky just to get that far. Then to even get, I mean, you've seen Entourage, right? Johnny Drama, the character. I mean, like that. That's an actor. If anybody wants to know what is an actor's journey, watch Entourage. Watch Johnny Drama that is an actor's life. It, it captures it perfectly because not most people aren't Vince, the star of the show, who's the A-list star. Most people are, if they're lucky, Johnny, because he gets to work. Most people don't even get to work. So um, I tried, you know, I, I I read for some things and then I, not only did I not get a lot of them because most actors don't get most things, but I wasn't really inspired by the scripts I was reading. I just thought I can write better than this. This is really not good. Um Granted, there's, you know, a lot of auditions for a lot of bad stuff. Um, so I'm not saying I was aud auditioning for like Scorsese or anything, but, um, but yeah, uh, I wish at that time that I got more gigs because I think, um, I just think I'm a natural entertainer, right? So if my path were meant to go that way, I probably would have, I don't know, meant to have, I, I would have had more success maybe. And there's just little shit that you're doing throughout the film that I love just, and, and obviously we, I will try to keep it as spoiler free as possible. I want to talk more about kind of like the making of, but whether it's you twirling out of scenes with you spinning, and twirling, <laughs> I like love that. Little, My twirly birds. Yeah. Just little shit like that. that I'm just like laughing and like, people are kind of like, I shouldn't say people like my girlfriend definitely laughed uh, when you spun over the crime scene tape. And I was just like, <laughs> listen, strap in because this is, this is how this is. And that's funny. That's my humor, dude. Like, or like, yeah, uh, just goofy, weird. Like, like most people don't get subtlety and I'm like all about it. And like so many times when I'm watching TV and film, I'll say, did you see how he like, you know, twitched his eyebrow a little bit there? Like, I, I love subtlety. I'm a huge fan of it. Even even though, back to the why, even Tex at <laughs> one point switches his voice as well after he goes, I see. <laughs> yeah, he's like, I mean, I see. You know, and that's after inept, inept. <laughs> no, Judd but, was insane. I loved Judd. Well, and that's kind of so we can we can kind of build off of that. What to talk about with this movie? Holy shit! No, man. There's you. I th believe it on this one. Like I had several questions. Most of the time, my limit is five. Like I'll just be like five. Let's fucking whatever. But I had several questions. So to that point, what was it like working with Judd Oman? Daniel so that's like the way that. that the way that Judd came into the movie was we had the same manager, if you can believe that. Um, I think the only explanation for that is he may have burned some bridges in his career, which is why me and he had the same manager. And I mean that as a compliment to him because he's a truly great actor. Um, I think he just got uh, jiggy with some people in the work environment. And by that, I mean um, just, you know, mm, uh, uh you angry. don't have to <laughs> you angry don't... he may have gotten angry with some people in the work environment and 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 he he didn't seem to kind of like play the game as much as your standard tom hanks tom cruise whatever actors that are 
always working, always, you know, just uh, being a company guy, which is how you have to be in the workplace to succeed, whether it's movies or retail or finance, doesn't matter, right? So essentially, I don't, I don't think my interpretation, not speaking for somebody else, but I don't think he really played the game as much as he could have because every time I've seen him in anything, he's so good. Um, but uh, we met through my manager at her, I think it was her Christmas party. I just remember sitting on a balcony with Judd. And at the time, I knew I was going to make takeout and I was kind of casting it or about to. And Pee Wee's Big Adventure is one of my favorite movies of all time. In fact, just last night, I fell asleep because I was exhausted. Fell asleep to Red Letter Meteor's Red Letter Media's review episode of Pee Wee's Big Adventure, which is for a fan, it's great. I, you know, love those guys or hate those guys. It was just a good episode of like being a fan and diving into this movie that was, you know, one of the best independent films ever made because that really was an independent film. Tim Burton hadn't directed anything. Pee Wee Herman wasn't a known name. Yes, it was made through Warner Brothers, but if you ever listen to any of the commentary or interviews about that movie, you see it's like a essentially a studio indie. Anyway, so, you know, growing up and seeing him interacting with Pee Wee Herman, one of my you know childhood favorite characters, uh, I see him on the balcony. I'm like, I'm going to go chat up this guy. And really, all the young actors at the party wanted to talk to Judd because he was one of the few people at the party who you'd seen him in stuff. And especially this is way back in the early 2000s. So it's not that far removed from the 80s and the 90s. So still like pretty impressive to see like one of the signature characters from one of the most popular comedies of the past couple of decades chilling on a balcony talking about adventures in thailand and shit like that so um and he was a wild dude he 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 had a lot of interesting crazy stories that i will never have in my entire life um and then uh i i, I probably asked him then uh, and he probably said send me a script and i remember he took it and then he's really he was really method so i remember in particular he asked me which I did not have until he asked me to do it. Can you write a bio for the character of Tex Whitmire? And uh, because, you know, he really wanted to live and breathe the character. He's, he was one of those, right? But you know what? His performances are amazing. So, hey, whatever it takes to get you there, sure. So I wrote this bullshit one-page thing off the top of my head. And the character of Tex Whitmire was like a hybrid of an old editor of mine at a newspaper in Houston, Tex, uh, and right down to some of the mannerisms, like this aforementioned newspaper editor, would walk down the hallway. It was almost menacing. He was such a weirdo. He would just walk down the hallway and go deedle dee, deedle deedle dee, and he would he would hum this. And especially if he was like mad at you, he would like have kind of a, like a like a like a twang to it. He was he was he was a very passive aggressive newspaper editor who was very Texas. He smelled like Texas. He was the most Texas man I've ever met in my life. So anyway, text was a combination of him. And some of the other corrupt individuals that I met covering uh, news stories in Texas. So there were some politicians and some business owners and such. So really, Tex Whitmire was was an um, uh, amalgam. Is it amalgam or amalgamation? Amalgamation, uh, whatever the proper word is. He was he was the combination of probably a lot of my Texas experience, also with a little bit of my real uh, uh, other newspaper, not real, but other newspaper editors in Arizona, I should say. Um, and working with him was great. He was like truly insane in the best way. And he gave really amazing performances. And um, yeah, uh, we had some, so we had some characters in the movie. Let's put it that way. Well, you did. And I just want to go back a minute there. Cause you're talking about kind of like, he even smelled like Texas. So I, mm -hmm. I, I, I want to Joe Noman, uh, the <laughs> actual newspaper editor who Tex Whitmire is based off of smelled like Texas. So I want to go to musky. <laughs> The boardroom. So this is another thing that I don't know to to you and I who, you know, aren't pieces of shit. It, it probably comes, <laughs> it comes naturally. But do you even realize that you subtly tackled toxic masculinity without it before that was even a fucking phrase? Like, do you? No. Even, how did yeah. I do that? I was not aware of that. Well, your disdain for how they talk to the Tell women, the, your disdain for right. how they talk to women. Well, even in the first scene, like obviously uh, I what was the 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 your your co-worker's name who was always talking about fucking getting blowjobs and shit like that. Justin Walker, Christian Sovitz from Clueless. You yes. recognized him. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. And you it's it's you blow it off so quickly that just like not only that but like you eat this shit and then like when they're talking how they do in the boardroom you 
aren't about that. And me and my chick were talking about that. Like, I don't even know if it, did you realize that you were doing that or is that no. just exactly because that's who you're not a piece of shit. That's what that's. I, of- <laughs> I would say I'm generally averse to labels. Right. So I'm, I'm not a big fan. I'm saying Democrat, Republican, left. Right. And so when you said that, I'm like, did I do that? So me, per- I try and avoid labels just in general in life. Do I stereotype all the time? Of course. It's part of like sarcasm. It's part, it's part of humor. But I just don't like labeling things or people, you know, because I think that everybody is a soul and everybody's complicated and everybody's like a mix of different things. And so um, I'm I'm real loath to even say that, you know, wh- wh- when it comes to politics, for example, I'll say I just like good ideas. If somebody has good ideas, I'll support it. If they have bad ideas, I won't. So um, the way that I would put what you call toxic masculin- masculinity as I would probably say, I guess I've just always been sensitive to people treating others well. Um, I. I just think people should be treated well. I like to be treated well. I like to treat other people well. And in in the workplace, maybe because more supervisors and people in positions of authority skew male over the years, granted things are changing now with like all the, you know, gender equality, diversity, like things are leveling off, I guess you could say, like to, to equality, right? But back years ago, 10, 20, 30, whatever, it was kind of like what? What does Mad Men portray? Or like what are the shows where it's like a lot of male bosses and very like homogenous thinking in that upper ranks being pushed down to the worker bees? And so like I think to me it was more that it, it, it was it was really just probably representation of workplaces that I've been in. So for example, um, you know, he was a champ doing it, but Justin Walker, who played Don Libeshitz, Justin's a great guy, and he played that role with so much, you know, passion that I love it. I don't even know if I can be that much of a scumbag in, in a movie, but you know, I don't think I'm as good of an actor as he is. You know, he's a better actor than I am. That's why he's able to take that and make it his own and like be completely believable. So, um, you know, I, I almost felt bad for him because all he does is just harass the cutie pie female reporter who he sits next to. And, and so the funny thing is that was based off of a reporter that I worked with. It was based off a columnist in Arizona. I'll, I won't go, you know, any further than that. I don't want to impugn anybody, but there was like a real kind of sleazy guy at the newspaper that I worked at who was like a local media star. And he was occasionally in this actually existed the media gossip columns for like, oh, so and so uh, was caught in the parking garage doing so, doing something like lewd with a young editorial assistant or whatever. So uh, the, the New Times, which was like the alternative news weekly in Phoenix, they used to run something called The Flash, which was like gossip about the media. So that's how large the commercial media used to be. I mean, now there's barely newspapers. But back in the day, in the 90s, when I was working in newspapers, really, um, it was more of like almost like a celebrity culture. So uh, Don Libichitz in Takeout is based off of a, a, col- a newspaper star, let's call him, uh, who would you know hit on all the women. And I, I remember I was really close with another low uh not low level but like young i should say another young reporter just starting out and like kind of new the to the newsroom and her good friend was hooking up with this guy and uh i think he had sent her a message that said something along the lines of do you want lessons on how to give blowjobs which is verbatim in takeout um so uh and, and ironically this person who it's based off of is still around, you know, my, my city and not working in that capacity any longer, but definitely a public facing figure in the communications world. Um, Well, then you kind of touched on one of the other questions that I had was how much of this did you kind of pull from real life? Because some of it, and I don't, I'm not that creative. Yeah. (laughs) And I don't mean the, uh, the uh, two dudes receiving sardines because they, (laughs) I love that. Oh my God. I haven't even thought of this stuff forever. Um, but like, cause I, there's a couple moments in there. Well, there's more than a couple, but there's moments in there where I'm going, he lived this. Cause I, obviously we, when we yeah. talked before, I know, I knew that you worked for the paper and I was like, there's no way that all of this shit is just him off the top. Not there at least 25%. He experienced at one point when he was working with the paper. Yeah. And, and let me just go back. I, 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 I saw a voice just said, love that movie. And somebody say, Oh yeah, look at this ego maniac. He loves his own film so much. It's like that. What I'm, what I mean is like, that's takeout is probably like in my life, my, my, the favorite project I've ever done. Let's put it that way. So I love it in the sense where it was fun. 
not saying it was so great, but I just, I love the experience of Mickey. I'm sorry. What was the actual question? Let me get back to that. I don't, uh, I just, how much of that was, I think you already answered it. I was saying how much of that did you really, oh, how much was real life? Yeah, Most yeah. of it, I think pretty much, I mean, in everything I've done, uh, the short film I did before takeout, uh, APU, our pot and underwear that Justin Walker was actually in that, that was somebody else's story. I had a neighbor with a really interesting life and I took one of his stories. I made it into a short film, but Ever since most of the uh, and I've written, you know, several of the scripts that have not been made yet anyway. Um, but uh, a lot of it takes from my personal life, even if it's like a, like an action movie, like the the lead character is probably going to be a lot like me. But Take Out and Brian Loves You were like straight up my experiences. Brian Loves You is more like me growing up in Arizona. Take Out was me being a member of the media. Um, and, you know, the all the characters in there are real. So like I basically play a more acerbic uh, version of myself. And then my girlfriend at the time was like a hybrid of some of the other crazy women that I dated at the time. Uh, and then of course I had like the, the soft hearted, like confidant at work that I would, you know, really confide in played by um, Yenny. And so I think her character's name was uh, Amy. Was it Amy? Anyway, so my confidant, yeah, it was great that I don't know that, right? Um, but uh, my confidant in the movie was like very, that, again, that was very true to life where, you know, I, I put this on me. I'm only going to blame myself. But when I was younger, I was with a couple different women who were like kind of, you know, not nice women. Um, were they? Why was Carrie? I with them? Were they like Carrie Maroney's? Uh, part? No, she was way over the top. But <laughs> yeah, that that was an extrapolation of what I was with. And and some of the things that happened. That, okay, so for example, one of the one of the girls I was with. So if you remember outside uh, the barbecue restaurant, uh, I kind of say something offhand. And then she just snaps and she turns to me and she says, what, what did you say? And that stuff like that would really happen to me. And I'm thinking, what am I doing with myself? And like somebody would put, put the focus back on me and say, Seth, what, what are you doing in this situation? And they would be right. I was wrong for staying in these bad relationships, but you know, as, as a young man, uh, I don't think we are as adept at typically, I think we're more susceptible to being taken advantage over by women because women are new to us and we're really enchanted by all the good parts of a relationship. And if we're henpecked, I think we may ignore that more in our younger years. And as we get older, we're a lot less likely to put ourselves in that situation. And I was probably like a lot of other young men who were with very attractive women who did not know how to fucking behave and, you know, just got swept up in a tornado of crazy sometimes. And I'm not saying anybody that I was with was literally crazy. They were all good women. And like most people, they were like balanced. They were complicated. But sometimes the women that I was that I were was with in my past tended to kind of like, you know, lay the smack down verbally. And uh, I would kind of put up with it because either I'm a patient person or a stupid person or whatever issues I was dealing with at the time. But yeah, I mean, a lot of that stuff with um, Carrie, who did a great job with that role um, as Connie. I mean, most of that stuff really happened to me. The only thing that didn't happen, unfortunately, was that I didn't walk out of the door when something ridiculous happened. I stayed in it way too long because I'm an idiot. Did you did you ever turn to an imaginary camera and say, can you believe this shit after sometimes? Probably. And that was ad-libbed. I, I, I remember the... The crew was, you know, more straightforward film school graduates. And it's like, this is how you make a movie. You set up the camera here. And you let, and I, I remember when I did that, everybody was, what? You just broke the fourth wall, bro. You know, and it's like, yeah, why not? Uh, and then I think we actually did maybe another take. But the cinematographer, uh, Vinny Pasco, um, who was really good, very talented. He was doing a lot of film at that time in Phoenix. I think he's now in Los Angeles, still working in, you know, cinematography or camera at least. Uh, but he he helped a lot make that movie. He really knew how to shoot a movie. I didn't. You know, I, I walked on takeout. I had had PA roles. I had been a producer and writer of a short film. Um, but I, I really had like crew members who knew what they were doing. Um, but yeah, I broke the fourth wall and uh, in life and in, in cinema. Well, uh, let's kind of talk about that a little bit, like working with the crew that you did, like people that are you know, film students through and through, and you're kind of doing your own thing. It was there anything that was really hard to overcome or that you just said, fuck it on takeout because of perhaps limitations? Well, I mean, a $13,000 movie, you're obviously going to have pretty, 
um, run of the mill equipment and not many backups. I will say this to any aspiring filmmakers out there. Um, don't use a broomstick with a mic duct taped to it as your boom mic. Because what's going to happen is you're going to get a lot of noise that is going to infiltrate your film and it's going to not have things sound the way they should. So, um, you know, everybody, I, all of our crew, they, they, they all meant well. We were, it was, just, it was that rare instance. And that's why at the very, very end of the movie, there's a shot of mainly like the crew and maybe a few key people. Uh, I think Ken Cobles in that shot because, you know, he was in so many scenes and I think he was shooting the last day, but it was really like summer camp. I mean, I, I recently read a book about the making of Days and Confused, uh, a bunch of interviews with a lot of the key people in Linklater's film. Um, and when I was reading that book, I related so much to take out. Granted, that's an iconic movie that will be remembered to, until the end of time uh, that really moved the needle. I'm not putting my uh, movie in the pantheon of that, but I'm saying I definitely related to the story of how everybody looks back like, it was the most fun time ever. It was summer camp. It didn't seem like work. And for us, I mean, especially with like no money, obviously they're going to have to have a good time. So what do I do? You know, I keep the attitude like fun, light. I don't overwork them. We have good food on set, you know, every day. I mean, obviously we're making a movie with food as a central, bad food as, as a central theme as to what not to do in life. So me, I've always tried to skew healthy. And so, uh, you know, just having, having like a good, comfortable environment because film is uncomfortable you work long hours you're hot you're cold you're tired you're stressed you know it, it's it's i recently did a project more in the real world that was a high stress project that reminded me of my films uh and what it's like doing that and i really think if you ever make a film on your own an independent production really nothing in the workplace will ever be able to challenge you because there's there's nothing like it so you're starting from nothing the air and you're creating a script and you're creating all the people to act out the parts and film the parts and record the parts and then when that's done you're sitting in rooms with people who are like piecing it together and making it look amazing and and if you can make a film i really think in business you can do anything because it the odds are so against you to not only have the papers but get the money to hire the peoples to do the things and then after that if you're able to like even have a finished product to get it to a place where people in the world can see it, it's almost like, I think I've mentioned this before in another interview. I don't want to be redundant, but I mean, it's almost impossible. So the point of that is we had a lot of fun, you know, and we were all young. I mean, this was 2004. So I was in my late twenties. Most of my crew was younger than me. I remember going back and like scouting the the local area film schools and taking meetings. And I, I, I lucked into a couple of good people who brought others with them and it was just the kind of thing where like we were having a lot of fun and 2000, summer of 2004 in Phoenix, nothing's going on because it's Phoenix and it's 150 degrees. And if you want to do some movies and you're in Arizonas, there's not a lot of options. So you got to get with this, this Landau kid because he's doing one. And we were just we were like the only game in town. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it was good times. But as far as like I had a great DP. I had not great rest of it because anybody will tell you that knows production. The hardest thing to find is production sound. Having a good sound mixer is much harder to find than anybody than a cinematographer, gaffer, lighting, electrician. It's such a, such a small niche in the world to be able to do it well and clear and affordable. I mean, so our production sound was done by somebody who was a really great guy, but you know, he was just like a jack of all trades production guy, right? So he wasn't technically a sound recordist. And then when when we get to our professional P. Daniel Newman, who was the audio uh, mixer and uh, sound editor for Takeout, he's like, "What the fuck did you do?" Because he he's professional. He had his own home sound stage. The only reason why Takeout is actually out there, I shouldn't say the only reason. One of the only reasons is Dan Newman, because it production sound was almost unlistenable. And to this day, when people watch the movie and they don't say anything about the sound, it's amazing to me because I know every little thing that happened. And I remember editing it and looking at the sound waves and seeing all the fucking like noise and pops that we had to like meticulously take out in post-production and watching Dan Newman like look at me like, really, do I have to remove that? Yes, I can hear it. It's not supposed to be in the movie. If I'm hearing this, like we need to take that out, you know? So um, it's a lesson for the rest of my life. I will be like so sensitive to um, 
to like good quality sound. Speaking of which, so I just messed up my microphone. Hold on a second. So two things there that you actually there talked about. Can you hear me? First, there we go. Better. Yeah. So two things that you had actually said there. So uh, one thing that we didn't talk about before we went on mic, um, I also attended the Los Angeles Film School. And for all you <laughs> aspiring filmmakers out there, first of all, you don't need film school. Just like mm -mm. That, that's straight. You, no, you don't. No, but you don't. listen to this man, Seth, here, because if if I could go back and do it and I was still going to go to film school, it would have been sound all day. I'd still be fucking working. If oh, I, man. Like You're rich if, man. Yeah, dude, I, I fucked up. And I and like what's really fucked up is like I kind of knew that even before I graduated. Like it was like months before I graduated. I'm like. Why did I fucking major in directing and writing? Everybody wants to be. A Everybody wants to be a director. Yeah, dude. Writer, you got more of a chance. Absolutely. But yeah, everybody wants to be a director. Um, you were talking about craft services there. I have a, I have a, I have a serious question for you. Did you feed your cast and crew takeout? <laughs> yes, but not from a fast food restaurant. We did have some takeout, but it was from like the higher end and then my mom catered some of the i remember my mom made these like uh chicken salad wraps that everybody went crazy for it was really like camp we were all in our mid to late 20s for the most part on the crew some of the cast were older but it really was it was like it was such a great experience and i, I think some of the best independent films you'll hear them talk about that because really independent art the money's not going to be there unless it's like a studio nd like a Wee's big adventure and that they weren't rich or anything but they they could afford things right um and they still had duct tape holding some of the stuff together, but like a different level. Um, and incidentally, so the aforementioned Vinny Pasco, uh, this is me and him. So I, I brought one of my, I still have this to this day. Like, so I, I have a cup from Chief Beef. I've got one of the yarmulkes from Shalom Bagel. Uh, I got one of the actual papers used in the movie. Like, I, this has just been like a thing that I've kept in my home office ever since. And then there's also <laughs> the thrill of the chase signed. By Chase Masterson. What do you think of that? Jealous? <laughs> Hell, um, well, I'm kind of mad that you don't have the menu for uh, "City You Down and Stuff of Your Face." City You Down, Stuff of Your Face. Yeah, so that's that's basically Buca de Beppo, um, and like ev everything in the movie is something. So, uh, "City You Down, Stuff of Your Face" is Buca de Beppo. Um, Baba Barbecue Texas Feeder. I think it's just a typical like that. That might not be something specific, but that's a traditional Texas steakhouse um then uh shalom bagel it well okay i shouldn't say everything something some of them are something some of them are fictional but they're all like you know it's like an einstein's kind of thing just over the top jewed out you know um what else was there i, I will tell you one of my favorite he beef yeah yeah he beef one of my favorite moments in uh city you down and stuff you face it is actually off screen and it's only it's only briefly but somebody somebody in the background yells pizza and then you hear a guy go i'm italian, I'm italian. <laughs> yeah, that was me <laughs> so we we did a lot of adr because we had such shit production sound and again not trying not trying to like oh, why does my thing keep going down i think my, my new mic is self-regulating okay uh, you sound hear? great here do i really okay great good to hear um yeah but uh we did a lot of adr just to fill in the space um, and the production style wasn't that bad, but it, it could have been much better. Um, sorry, I'm adjusting. Oh, you're fine. You're fine. I actually, I, and then I'm going to go wait, but did you even answer the question whether or not you were fighting the good fight when you, when you wrote this film, were you? Oh yeah. Um, so I would say, so, uh, by the way, my mic is back. So sorry for the equipment malfunction. Um, so yeah, I kind of, I mean, so I, I think. The favorite thing I've ever written in my life has been that what was that scene on the golf course between Dan Roebuck and Ken Kolb. So to this day, I'll be rich. The, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's to me. And I'm really proud of myself for writing that because I wrote that when I was in my mid to late twenties before I knew even a fraction of what I know now. And I still know nothing, but I'm, I'm a work in progress. Like everybody I'm, I'm learning, but, um, but I mean, I'm really proud of myself for like seeing the world so clearly, even at that younger age, um, and uh, I, I think I was just trying to express myself and just I wasn't trying to do anything necessarily. I think I was just trying to portray the world that I saw in comedic terms to make to have a catharsis and be able to laugh about it because it's so ridiculous. And I just think in life, sometimes you have to laugh 
or you're going to cry or get depressed or it's just a really good coping mechanism. And so I've just always kind of, I, I, I always feel like an alien. I don't feel like I'm human a lot of the time in a sense where like humans and the earth and the way things are, are just, they seem so ridiculous to me so many times. Like how do, how do people do the things they do to each other sometimes? Right. Um, we are shockingly similar, sir shockingly similar yeah. i don't yeah. feel the Three line i always, like right that i do the line that i say weekly is i don't feel a part of this world anymore i just i don't like i don't understand i i, I just and, and like you said i i think as you get older i don't know if you submit to it or whatever the case may be is uh, for me i know it's ignoring like I, 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 I ignore the political stuff way more now. Cause right. like you when you're to. all, yeah, when you're all charged up in your mid twenties, you know, you're, you're ready to fight. And now it's like, Oh, that's right. If I don't have billions of dollars backing me, a bulletproof soapbox, then I'm probably not making a dent, you know, unless I'm super fucking talented, which I'm not. So you, you'd kind of just turn the other way. Like I'll just, I'm I'm going to enjoy myself while I'm here and then and then move on. But I do want to talk about that scene that you had wrote specifically working with Kevin, who is one of my favorite characters in the movie that I still think holds up today, which is who's Kevin uh, uh, what was his name, Kevin Kolb. Oh, Ken, Ken Kolb. Oh, Ken. man. Oh, Kevin. Tell me what you think about him, because I have something I want to throw by you and see if you agree. I still love it. Like, I like that stupid new new york day i like i like <laughs> my that. grandpa basically <laughs> dude He's i completely like model my grandfather oh my goodness is it really ken it's ken Fucking ken I cold uh so ken cold um he was like a part-time actor most of his life I, th I think he experimented in hollywood i met him again through my manager my my, my manager the unfortunately the part of janice hansen rip um she had a lot of good relationships with uh with talent and she knew a lot of talented actors and a lot of them from Janice are in uh, takeout. So Ken was local based in um, based in Phoenix. He has his own private business. He does it very well. And went to the military. He was a Marine, got out, got into his business that he's in to this day. Um, I think he's retired now, but um, he did very well for himself in business, but he loved acting and he'd be in movies here and there. And, and one of the movies he was in called ghost town, I found for free on either youtube i just found it in the corner of the internet and he plays this really creepy like ghost cowboy i mean ghost town um and he's just he's great there are so many great performers in the world that you'll never hear of um but uh yeah he he basically played my grandfather that was that was an accelerated version of my grandfather who was just like the kind of guy who was successful and kind of carefree and wasn't really in touch with his emotions and like to keep things really surface. How's it going? Great. All right. Well, I'll talk to you later. It's like, I, like you barely get anything out. And I think that's apparent in the movie. And, you know, I love my grandfather. Um, and I think, you know, sometimes you kind of apply satire to the ones you love. Um, so, yeah. And then, and then, so the funny thing, I, to me, one of the funniest jokes in the entire movie is when he says, talk to your grandmother, and it's like a 16-year-old girl. And I say, hi, grandma, right? So basically, that was an accidental laugh because I was trying to cast somebody who mirrored his age. I wanted a legit grandmother, but I couldn't, I couldn't, it's it's harder to find older actors, right? They either make a certain amount of money, they're not, it, younger actors, easy peasy. Go to any city, you'll find a million younger actors to fill any role you want harder when you get niche or you need a specialist or a stunt guy or girl or old. So basically just like because of the independent nature of the film it would have cost more money. And I didn't know anybody who could have played that role. So my cousin Brooke played it at the time. I don't even remember what age she was. Um, but my cousin Brooke played Iris Turk and she at the time wanted to be an actress and she's really good. She's like, she's always been very dramatic and um, she was legit a good act a good actress. I think she even went to New York and she succeeded in one of their good acting schools. So it's just, you know, a family member stepped into that role. Um, but it, it resulted in, I think one of the best members, laughs, right? You had a lot mm -hmm. of family members in this. I think I counted at least three or four Landau's in it. Unless it was my Kyle, sister was in it. Unless they all duped you and they were like, Hey Seth, I'm a Landau too. And then you, so, okay. So what happened was my, my, my then girlfriend is in it, but she's credited as Landau because she didn't 
like her last name because she had some family issues going on at the time. She just didn't want to publicize her name. So she wasn't, you know, married to me or anything. She just took my name for the credits. And then, so she was in it and uh, my sister was in it. it during the, during the Connie breakup scene, she was one of the girls. Um, so yeah, there were, there were a few, you know, like when you do independent film, like even in swingers, uh, you know, John Favreau and I think John Favreau's grandmother was at the uh, blackjack table and, in made Vincent Vaughn's uh, dad was the football coach. You know, like that's just what you do. Um, now, they're available. They're cheap. That scene that you wrote with Ken and Daniel did that. Did that scene propel you to form the relationship with Daniel after the fact? Because I know you and him still remain close, if I remember, relatively close. Still, chat. Dan Roebuck. Yes. So Dan Roebuck is a really good friend of my friend, Dan Schweiger. So that's our mutual connection. Dan Roebuck is also just, he's a really nice guy. Um, you know, he, he's one of the, one of the people you meet in Hollywood. Who's just, he's a real guy. Uh, and a lot of people seem fake. That's why I say real. I mean, everybody's real, but um, you could talk to him like you would just somebody in any other city. You know, he, he's just, he's a nice person who wants to support artists. And, you know, George went was like that with, with, um, with uh, Brian loves you where he, he believed in the project and he's like, all right, I, I normally make way more money than this, but sure kid, you know, I'll throw you a bone. So, um, so Dan Roebuck, I remember having the conversation with him to offer him the role. I didn't have him audition. If you can believe that <laughs> he just got an offer. Um, so I was, I was in my mom's condo in Gilbert having a conversation with him. And I, I, I some, you know how sometimes you remember where you are when you talk to somebody on the phone. Uh, so I was talking to him on the phone and he's like, yeah, Seth, he's like, I'll, I'll be in your movie, but can you put a tentative yes on it? Because he said this, I remember this, these words, you know, if like the big enchilada comes, he said that verbatim, I remember that, then I might have to like take it, which I'm like, yeah, fair. If you get a studio offer with something that pays you 10, you know, hundreds of hundreds of thousands of dollars or or more. Yes, totally understand. So um, but I mean, of course, you know, he, that was like, if I get my, my Austin powers or, you know what I mean? Something like that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, he was, that's how the relationship started with him. Dan Schweiger brought Dan Roebuck into the fold because it was like a, you know, a credible actor who he knew. And, uh, Dan Schweiger, I think is in takeout three times. Um, yep. Uh, he's, he's big Willie style, the guy who gets the party thrown for him. He's the crazy person who says, yeah, put the bitch down in the background that you would never notice. And he's another role. He's, he's in there like a few times. I remember he is in, Oh, uh, he's the, he's the, he's the, uh, the Casanova too. Uh, he's in one of my favorite movies of all time, which is Bubba, Bubba Hotep. Bubba, Bubba Hotep. Hotep for sure. And just, just, because this is what we do and I like informing my audience. He's also in Phantasm Ravager, which mm -hmm. I think is actually not a bad installment in the Phantasm <laughs> franchise. Out of out of the ones that exist, that's actually one of the better ones. But anyway, anyway, I dig it. And actually one of one of the people that was in the the film actually like went on to do like Better Call Saul. Who was that? Jalon Vanover, I think. Better Jalone. Call yeah. Well, so Jalone, I also met through Jan uh, Janice. Jalone played Brody, I think his name was in Brian Loves You, my my crazy roommate cellmate in Brian Loves You. And he played a really hilarious um barbecue waiter in in takeout. And I always told him, like, I, I, I saw something in Jalone where I'm like, man, if you stick with it, you're gonna you're gonna break. You're he's great. I I'm not sure if he had kind of the break that I envisioned yet. I mean, he still may. I I think he's a great performer. I'm he should be a household name. Let's just put it that way. Um, and and I still believe if he sticks with it, he eventually will be. Sometimes people make it in their teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. You know, I, I don't even I'm imagining he's still acting, but he was definitely one of the best performers I've ever worked with. Yeah, I'm still hoping I'm, I'm I'm in my 40s and I'm looking for my big break as an actor. 40s is still young. It really is, especially yeah, in Hollywood. But I mean, I mean that there are, I know Hollywood's about youth, but there are a lot of you know, mature actors who have very strong careers. I mean, well, the problem with you and I is, is that we're white. Anyway, we're not tackling that today. We did. I'm mention Jewish. <laughs> so <laughs> I get that card. If if you were, if you were discriminated against and picked on for more than 10 years, you get to play the Jewish card. So I'll, I'll whip that out any day. So we had mentioned Brian loves you a couple of times. What did you, if anything, and you can just be like nothing. I fucking I took nothing. What did you take from takeout 
into Brian Loves You, whether it be I'll never fucking do that again or <laughs> like I know it seems kind of like a cliche question. But like, as you know, we've you've been on the show before. There's a lot of people that don't want to make the same mistakes, say, perhaps you and I did, um, you know, if they move yeah. forward with trying to make their own film. Yeah, I definitely took a lot of things from Takeout and the Brian Loves You. I think anybody would, uh, you know, playing with no budget. Uh, and then, you know, for me, Brian Loves You was almost like double. I went from 13,000 to 25 ish. So uh, it still wasn't a lot, but I was able to afford a little bit more um, and call in less favors. I would say that I would say almost say the scope of Takeout is much grander than Brian Loves You. It is a bigger cast. It had more locations and it had food locations. You know how hard it is to get restaurants. Um yeah, uh, but what I took away from it was make sure you have enough money to pay money for the key crew positions that you need. So, for example, we had a professional sound recordist for Brian Loves You. Uh, the the DP on Takeout, director of photography, was still professional, but he was young. He happened to be good. Again, on Brian Loves You, I made sure I had somebody who was good, incredible. Um, we had enough... Um, equipment even though it was bare bones we still had enough we did not on takeout and i learned make sure you put actors in the movie who distributors will care about um not to say that we didn't have a lot of great actors in takeout but when it came time to selling the movie um you need certain names in it so a distributor will say okay i'll release this and typically who's it the questions you hear what's it about who's in it first two always so what did you know how important do you think that is well, even from a technical aspect, did you, with the exception of sound, which we already kind of touched on, did you walk into Brian Loves You within the back of your mind? Because I do happen to agree with what you said. I think the scope of Takeout, which is ironic because it's your first film and then you went to mm -hmm. Brian Loves You, the scope mm -hmm. of Takeout much larger than mm -hmm. Brian Loves You. And I think like as much of a horror fan as I am, I think I am tend to lean towards takeout more just because of the comedy element at the end of the day i just like goofy fucking comedies and that i think Same. it's on all fucking levels but like was there anything like like i'm not i won't do again that you walked in with brian loves you um is some are you saying did i have a bad experience in brian loves you or just a lesson that i know that i know a not lesson that you a lesson that maybe you took from takeout into brian loves you oh, like I can't sorry do um Ye the, so the aforementioned that I just said that that would apply, uh, but also I probably more carefully vetted the actors because um, I I'm I'm a trusting person by nature, you know. Like I I don't steal, I don't take advantage of people, I don't I don't I don't do things I'm not supposed to in general, right? Um, and I definitely don't hurt people. So I think sometimes when you are like that, there's some kind of inherent naivete that exists in most of our ilk where you think the other people are like that. So takeout was really my first experience as an adult where I was in charge of the company. I hired everybody. I created everything. And when you make your own company, you want everybody to have fun and be a family and enjoy. And, and yes, takeout was, like I said, it was like summer camp. It was a family, but there were some problem children in that stable. And a couple of the actors really kind of like made my life difficult. And not that they were trying to do that. It could have been like, I need your help for this thing to help the movie along. And they just like didn't address it and they took their sweet time and it really like stressed me out. Or there was another actor who got upset because they showed up to set hungover, still gave a good performance. Um, and then asked for another plane ticket out because they didn't want to get on a plane later that day when they were supposed to be after they wrapped. Um, and I said, I'm sorry, I, I can't, that's not in the budget. So they, uh, started bad mouthing the production to sag. And then I got a call from sag and they're like, Hey, are you guys abusing extras? I'm like abusing extras. What does that mean? Like how, like it was such a weird turn of phrase. And uh, so basically I, I, I spoke to sag. I told them what was going on. They came out. They're like, yeah, you look all good, but it, but the actors caused problems because of their own issues. It wasn't anything necessarily that happened on the set. They just brought their drama to, my world and that was my first time dealing with it i had never really been a boss before i had never been a supervisor i had never been in charge of all these things so i just thought like okay everybody's like me they care about this just as much as i do they're just as responsible as me no so going into brian loves you i definitely 
I, I was more careful, not to say that there were no problems, but I, I was a lot more careful with who I let into my world, both on the crew and in the cast, especially with a small production, you really can't afford to have flare ups. And I'm, I'm surprised we got through takeout like we did because, you know, there were some challenges on the back end that were thankfully resolved. And, and the thing is when you deal with problem personalities in the workplace, everybody wants to just be a smart ass and just like say, Oh, fuck you. You suck. You can never do that. You always have to be the bigger person. You always have to like take it. They're going to like, you know, talk and, you know, like verbally abuse or whatever you, and it's like, okay, I understand. What if we do it this way? Because you, to de-escalate a situation, you have to be the bigger person. You have to be calm. You can't lose your shit. And then it's like, man, I wish I can be an asshole. I wish I could just act like a crazy bastard because I felt like it because I'm hungry or I'm, I'm whatever, you know, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna like, you know, just like, eh. but, uh, but I don't, you know, and you want to say like, bro, fuck you, you know, <laughs> like you're causing me problems. I don't have time for it. You can't, you know, when you're in a managerial position, you're responsible, you know, and you have to just like really keep a professional demeanor and, and, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know what the point is with that, but I, th I think it's just like a side note to anybody doing a film or really any creative project or any project. It's like, you know, you just you have to have the strength to to be the bigger person always because the one time you slip up, it's going to be probably held against you forever. So just don't slip up. Just be a, be strong. And sometimes this is a, this is a yogic phrase, but be comfortable being uncomfortable. If somebody's making your world uncomfortable, fine. You can deal with it. There's always a path forward. I really think most people can be reasoned with. Now, granted, there are some extreme circumstances where somebody cannot be reasoned with, but that's more of like in a criminal element. In 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 a normal work environment, when tempers flare and personalities get get you know nuts, there's usually a a smart path forward to resolve the situation. And so, I guess the point of that is, I had to do that with takeout, where I just wanted to like, oh, give the middle finger and yeah, man. Uh, you can't, you can't afford it because as soon as you throw gasoline on that fire, fire gets bigger. Being the bigger person, I think is a good lesson when it comes to independent art, because if you don't, there are just so many pitfalls that can snag you. That's, that's something you don't need on top of the normal reasons why you won't succeed. So out with the negative vibes in with the positive, a positive. Couple a couple of your favorite moments about making this film, something that maybe even you carry with you this day, something that you learned that was positive favorite moments on set. I almost fell asleep driving home from set one day. I remember that the, the only time in my life where I've, um, I've almost ever fallen asleep on the wheel at the wheel. And I've never, I don't drink. I've, I never even drank drunk, drunken. Um, but ever. So your, ever. Uh, I've had sips of things like it basically all the alcohol I've consumed in my life can probably fit into this. So, uh, and then when I was going through college, I would like, I would pretend to sip beers and stuff. And then people would come on my table, waiters or whatever. And they'd like pull it up. thinking it was empty. And it's like, Whoa, you still got a lot left in there. I'm like, I know. Thanks for blowing my cover. You know? Cause, because you want to fit in. And so like, I would kind of, mm, yeah, oh, yeah, we're having a great time. I'm, I'm enjoying this beverage. <laughs> you know, and I'm a good actor, right? So I can I can pretend like, yeah, I'm chilling. We're partying. We're getting crunk. You know, woo. You know, like because I'm I'm crazy enough without substances. I don't need them. I'm creative. I can go off. You know, like in a good way, in a creative way. I don't need like the stimulation. Like I I I I've got it in in here. Um. Anyway, yeah. So I was so tired because you know I had never been in charge of a film set before, and typically with a film set. You have 10 to 12 hour days. We, I, I take pride in always wrapping prior to 12. Most people who work production think, okay, I'm going to be working for 12 to 15 hours. And that's both, that's been most of the productions that I've been on uh, because a production day is 12 hours. So most even go over a little bit, whatever. Um, and I take great pride in, in wrapping early, just being a planning and being efficient. So you're wrapping around nine to 11, somewhere in there, uh, which you still get a lot done. And people really appreciate that. Nonetheless, e even though my days were shorter, you know, you're sleeping between one to four hours a night when you're in production on a micro budget movie, especially your first movie with a cast of like 5,000 or whoever, however many was in it. 
Um, but uh, yeah, I had this rental white Volvo because I, I used to have a 1996 Civic DX when I lived in LA. So whenever I'd visit Arizona, I'd get a sweet, sweet deal from Enterprise Rental Car where I get a baller car and I drive that home for the weekend. And and so back then I, I had good relations with my people at Enterprise, right? So I'd get Infinities and Mercedes and all kinds of cool cars to like take back to Arizona and feel like a big player coming in from California with the plates, driving around the hillbillies and Gilbert and Mesa, Arizona, you know? So, um, so I had this rental when I was on takeout and they would do, they would do long-term rentals, right? You take the car for a month, you get like a price break or whatever. So I had this really cool white Volvo during that production setting. I was driving that fine automobile somewhere in Scottsdale. And I'm like, well, that's not good. I almost just fell asleep. So that's a memory. Um, but that's not good. Oh, good you point. might have not got fucking Brian loves you if 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 that would have yeah. went the other way. But yeah. but I you know, I, I think that that means you did a job well done. If you ask me that that means, you know, you busted your ass that day. Now, obviously, no, you don't want to be falling yeah. asleep behind the wheel. But that means yeah. like I produced something today so much so that I'm <laughs> fucking about to fall asleep at the goddamn wheel here. I'll tell you. Okay, so the best memories I have of that were my aunt and uncle back then had a rental house in Scottsdale, a really nice condo in a nice part of Scottsdale. Anybody who's not familiar with Arizona, Scottsdale is like the nice part of town, you know. And so we had uh, it wasn't like that rich, but it was just it was a nice part of town with amenities and all the restaurants you need. And they had a condo that was kind of like home base for our production because they let me use it for the duration of the production. So if I were staying in a hotel, I'd have some of the actors from out of town stay at the condo. And um, every night, I think we shot for about 18 days. Um, every night after we would wrap, we'd go back to the condo and we'd watch dailies. And so it would be, you know, the the usual suspects. It would be sound, camera, some of the actors. Um, and, and so that I think that to me is my favorite memory of of making takeout was like the the end of the day dailies that we would consume at, at the condo, which was like the home base. The garage doubled as like, you know, a storage for equipment and um you know at least one or several people were were staying there and something else i should mention uh be, so, so we don't so we don't drop it i think this is a weird fact about takeout there are a lot of weird things about takeout it's just it's a unique movie in a lot of ways let's not forget sean baker though we have to mention him um he had another takeout okay so two quick things i don't want to forget this because i know with us we get to yap in we're, we're a couple of old yentas over here before you know what it's like five hours um so, uh, what was it? What was I going to say? Oh yeah. There were several actors who take out was their last movie. And I don't know how many movies can claim like several. So Mike Hungerford, RIP, who's a very good character actor. He was in some things he, he had, he was in big movies with like really small parts and he was a really nice guy. He was a really good friend of my friend, Tom Noga, who played like, again, 10 roles in the movie. Tom was the power guy at the beginning. He was the bodyguard who didn't speak. Um, and Tom Noga yeah, was also in, uh, Brian Austin. loves you, but so Didn't you have an uh, Austin powers bit with Tom at one point at, uh, towards the, towards the end of takeout. <laughs> yes. With the, with the cart. Yeah. 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 Um, so, uh, unfortunately Mike, who's no longer with us, that was his last movie. Unfortunately, RIP again, Danny Zorn, that was his last movie. Danny Zorn was most known, I think, for his turn at the end of the Home Improvement TV show, but he was in other studio movies and like smaller roles. But he was a New York actor that was friends with Justin Walker. Justin Walker, his last appearance in a movie. Um, and when Takeout was released in 2022 um, and we sent out some uh, advance notice to media, The Hollywood Reporter, no shit, was going to do a story on Takeout being released. The Hollywood Reporter does not do stories on direct to video direct to streaming whatever videos that are 30 years old but because justin walker was in it and because there was the interest at the time you know not that long ago last year two years ago 2022 um they wanted to say hey the guy from clueless is in something else and so we went back and forth with the hollywood reporter and uh i reached out to justin i found him justin is the kind of guy who's like really hard to reach even back in the day when he was acting in la I met him. This is wow. Things come full circle. I met Justin Walker through the film critic at the Arizona Republic in the nineties because he was friends with Justin's family. Okay. And so I remember the thing when I, when I, when I first met Justin Walker, he was a host on the X show, 
which was kind of like a precursor to the man show or something like that. And um, I remember I called him when I got out there and like I, what I remember about Justin Walker is he was like real smooth, real slick, you know, hey, cat daddy, kind of like his like character in Clueless. He's like he's always talking like real jive, real hip, real fast. And I felt like such a nerd talking to this guy because he had the lingo down, baby. You know, he was like talking Hollywood smooth and he would hang up without saying goodbye. It freaked me out. He would always do that. We'd be talking and then he's like, all right, talk to you later. Like, OK, but click. He's already gone. People who don't say goodbye freak me out. He would never say goodbye. It was like, I'm not that cool. I can't hang up on somebody without saying goodbye or peace or something, right? So so Justin, I remember I called him when I was doing uh, takeout or no, I called him when I was doing the short film and I was ex I was describing it to him. He's like, oh, is it an indie? I'm like, uh, yeah, I didn't know. I'd never heard that term before. I was so new when I did my short film. I didn't know what he meant by that. But yes, it was an indie. And so- um, so he, because he had that signature role in Clueless, the Hollywood reporter was going to do something. So I reached out to him and I said, Hey man, um, can you do this interview? And, uh, unfortunately he wasn't interested. So, uh, for his own reasons, I, I don't begrudge it. I don't begrudge him. He, he had his reasons and I, I respect him. Um, and of course he talked to me and he, and he, he, of course, like tracking him down was really difficult. I had to like stalk him and then like email him several times and call him and text him. And he would finally respond to me. It's so frustrating, but um, so we, we were going to be in the Hollywood reporter. Unfortunately, we were not, uh, because one of our signature actors, uh, declined the publicity, which again, completely his right. Uh, I totally understand. Um, and then, uh, there were a few others, but yeah, there were several actors. So I don't know if that's a, if that's exactly a ringing endorsement for the movie, <laughs> the well, last movie you will ever be in. You want to be in it? Well, yeah, I actually had that written down, but then like the more I kind of like wit went over my notes i was like you don't want to bring that up man but like, bring up anything i don't mind i mean you know like i the i i really don't hide from anything i've ever done in my life you know like i think um everything has been with good intent so even the embarrassing things i'm fine talking about and, okay so let's let's touch on this real quick so being a former member of the meteor myself like i know how to like do the press and stuff right um and i always i always think and kevin smith i remember back in the day was really good about this he was the filmmaker who was the best with the press so if you ever look at his um his old talks that were on dvd that are now on youtube or wherever where he do his college tours and stuff he'd always tell vignettes about you know his relationship with the media and press and you know he he was the most savvy filmmaker I've ever seen in my career that just knew how to do it. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Um, I consume those talks a lot. My my favorite Kevin Smith stories were Prince and John Peters. The best. If anybody's out there, just just YouTube search Kevin Smith, John Peters, J-O-N Peters, or Kevin Smith Prince. Great stories. I'll watch them like I watch movies. So funny. Um, what was the point of that? So basically, so this rich kid in New York, Sean Baker, uh, who's now like a pretty well-known director, you know, of NDs and studio or whatever. He he's he's in there. He's he does things. He makes his living as a director. And I'm <laughs> quite uh you know happy that he gets to do that because it's it's a rare profession to succeed at. So, you know, good for him. Um, but at the time we were both in about the same place where we were like kind of low budget uh filmmakers and but he was a rich kid from New York. I'm calling him a fucking rich kid because he had a lawyer send me a letter. So like I was in post-production on takeout and I don't know how he, he, I think he found like my PR guy. Cause it went to some general like takeout movie at yahoo.com email address, something weird like that. But it was something that I was, I was monitoring and uh, it was a cease and desist letter from some relative of his that was like a lawyer in New York. And it said, we are aware that you are making a film with the title of uh, takeout and you can't do that because we got it first. Mine, 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 my, my title. You can't do it. Me do it. So that's not what it said, but it basically said that. It said, essentially, please cease and desist with this title because we feel that you're going to adversely affect our film's prospects of success, which is fucking stupid. And you're an idiot for saying that. So and you're a jerk off for sending an independent filmmaker uh, a cease and desist you rich asshole. So, um, so basically, um, that was sent, you know, on behalf of that filmmaker and his, like his like moody, uh, you know, drama about a takeout delivery on a guy on a bicycle's journey through New York. It's like, so, you know, so dark and so moody and so dramatic. So, um, 
So basically I took that letter. I remember my girlfriend at the time was like super afraid of everything of like, Oh no, you better change the title. I, I remember her reaction. And I'm like, uh, no. What's that? Said I, Hey, I got one of those. Yeah. So, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you need, you need a balance, right? And that's always Dude, a good thing, but absolutely. She keeps me grounded. <laughs> right. Uh, but I think this was a little bit fearful. I'm like, you know, any lawyer can sue anybody for anything. It's not that big of a fucking deal. It's like, you know, just because you say it doesn't mean I have to do it. Do you think that I'm going to be afraid because of somebody who passed the bar was smart enough to draft a letter and send it to an email that I received? Like, no, you have to have a stronger argument than, than we own the words take out and you don't. Not true. So essentially what I did <laughs> was I forwarded that letter to a bunch of media. And I said, hey, you know, you guys interested in this? This is like, you know, can you believe this? Like uh, one independent filmmaker is trying to, you know, harsh the buzz of another. And and so basically the LA Times did a story on it. And to this day, you can find it online. It's not that hard. Um, the LA Times did a story on it and it got take out like quite a bit of press at the time. Back when more, way more people read the hard copy paper you would you would see in an office and stuff. It was like the like if entertainment was like the D section or whatever or e, or E, it was like the E2 story. It was teased on the cover of the entertainment section and it was like right inside. So it it was that story was prominently placed on a work day in the L.A. Times. Um, I also pitched it to outlets that were this close to doing a story on it. Wall Street Journal and New York Times. I shit you not. So uh, they didn't. They didn't end up doing the story, but that's how it works. Sometimes in media, it's like, you know, you, you pique the reporter's interest. They run it by an editor or they got other stuff that comes up. But I remember it was... Um, Sorry, I didn't mean to like, I just tapped the thing. I should know better than that because it affected the audio. Always thinking about the audio. It's all right. It's quite all right. Um, so I, I think it was like Sharon Waxman at the New York Times was going to do a story. And I forget the name of the gentleman at the Wall Street Journal, but they were interested because it's like, huh, you don't see this very often, right? And both of our movies, you know, his, I think, was further along and may have had distribution. Yeah, it did. His had distribution at the time. Mine didn't have distribution, but you can look at IMDb and see there are real actors in it. So it looks legit, right? You have Judd Oman, Dan Roebuck, Justin Walker, because even then that wasn't that far removed from Clueless. So Justin Walker was definitely had way more attention back then. Uh, and that would have been really his second role. Uh, well, not, he was in some other like low budget in these, but that was, I don't know, like it, he was more of a name back then. Let's put it that way. So, um, uh, yeah. And so like we got some media attention for some, some of the other film blogs picked it up. And to this day, that's on Wikipedia. It's on his Wikipedia. It's on my Wikipedia. And it's wrong. For the record, what's on Wikipedia is completely wrong. Because on his Wikipedia, it says something like, they decided to release the movie later because of a dispute with the film takeout from Seth Lando of the same name. There was no dispute. There was nothing going on. My movie had nothing to do with anything that the takeout delivery boy movie did. It's just, it's part of their story if they want to have an excuse for something or other, but there was nothing. It was, it was a superfluous letter sent to a poor filmmaker who was savvy enough to flip it and just send it to the media and say, Hey, you want to give me some free promotion for this? And they did not that it helped me so much because the movie took 18 years to be distributed, but, um, you know, I'll I'll definitely poke fun at myself all day long, you know, but I'll also poke fun at other people who do stupid shit. And I think that was just dumb. And to this day, because of the way the Internet works and because of the way Wikipedia works, it's like it's just wrong. And so on mine, it says Seth Landau had like a uh, problem with Michael Sergio. I, I only know that name because it's on my it was on my Wikipedia for so long. I have no idea who Michael Sergio is. It sounds like somebody who owns an Italian restaurant in Manhattan. That's what it sounds like to me. I I, I have no idea who this person is. Maybe so, like uh, sit down and stuff in your face. Maybe like a restaurant. Something like that. <laughs> anyway, so the point is not to get too wound up about this, but I've never been able to talk about it on any kind of forum, but and not that anyone cares, but it does live online. And for the record, it's all wrong. It was a simple cease and desist that was pointed out for being stupid. And there you go. Well, I think you can kick that around for another indie film. I think that would be an intriguing indie film about two indie filmmakers <laughs> <laughs> getting litigious with each other. I think that That's would be funny. Funny, And you know uh, what? Just like the logic there, like who gives a shit if there are two movies with the same name? I mean, I would never even cross my mind to ask them to change their title. But what do I know? Uh, I 
anyway, I, I would like to wind our interview down, but I got some things that I want to tell you and some things that I want to ask you. I'm going to tell you seven things. Yes. Starting uh, now. At least three or four. And one of those things <laughs> is I kind of mentioned it earlier. Can you, and I know you got a new gig now and you're every, everything seems to be flowing new gig, new girl. Everything's great. Mm-hmm. Can you do some more acting, man? Yeah. I, I'd, I I'd be open to it. Like, like if I were to, you know, write a little something, can I call this Seth? is an offer? <laughs> this, this is yeah. I'm putting you on the spot on, on camera, air on off. air because like you look like a dick if you say no. <laughs> Sorry, no. Sean. I just can't facilitate that request. <laughs> I'm going to have to pass. I didn't even tell you what it was. Yeah. I know what it is. Yeah. And it sucks. OK, Sean, if, you, <laughs> if you're going to make something, you'd have made something by now. But no, I mean that like in. I, I know that that's such a fucking weird thing or a weird way to frame it, but like. Who's I got watch- the gig? What's going on here? What are we talking about? What kind of project? No, I'm this? just talking in general, sir. You, I if want somebody to- came to me and say, I want to give you a bunch of money to act. Sure. I probably do it. I well, What if do I think that's going to happen? What if what if somebody came and said, I'll give you a little bit of money? <laughs> I guess I'm more or less just uh, saying that now that I've watched that movie twice in, mm-hmm. you know, the past three or four days i'm i'm kind of annoyed with you and i know it's not your fault but i'm just kind of annoyed that i don't get to see you more and laugh at you more because like it's my type of humor yeah. dude like it 100 percent the kind of because you do a great balance i think of being outlandish and subtle and dry at the same time which yeah. i don't i i feel I do feel like a fucking weak ass critic by saying this. It's not so easy to do, Seth, and you do it just <laughs> with ease. I'd like that's, that's that's a, when Wilson, who is that? I don't know who that was. I, this is some guy that just what, okay. but that's how I feel. Guy. That's how I feel when I watch you. I'm like, it's not all that. Like, there's people that can play the dry straight man and they're really fucking good at it. Mm-hmm. It's very rare when you can see both. So it was kind of me blowing smoke and asking you a question like, hey, when can we see you act again? But um, yeah, I appreciate probably- that. It was, was it was kind of heartbreaking to leave L.A. I mean, like I, I spent a good um, approximate 13 years there and it was just chasing film and TV. Um, and that's all I did for that long. I mean, I didn't vacation. I didn't save money. I didn't really make a lot of money. Uh, I made just enough to to get to another day in LA. Um, but yeah, I mean, I definitely, I tried to do what you were telling me to do for that many years consecutively with like not one vacation. I mean, sure. I went out of town a couple of times, maybe like San Diego or Phoenix or whatever, but that whole time it was just like, you know, it was like 50 cent naked or die trying. That's all it was. Legit dude. Like, I don't think people understand that if you're going to, you're going to be in that world, like you can never say no. And you best believe that you better be working sun up to sundown every day until either Mm -hmm. you fizzle out because like we were talking before off air, I mean, it sucks that it is a cliche that you kind of, you'll get used until uh, at least in my experience out there, I felt like I got used until Mm -hmm. I wasn't worth it anymore until I broke. And I wouldn't even say that I broke in a sense. It was more like, how often do I want to keep calling home and my friends have kids and in two story houses and they're paying 500 a month and I'm living, you know, it, at Crenshaw and Martin Luther King, our lives mm-hmm. weren't the same. And you know, it, it is what it is. And I still find it fucking wild that like you and I probably passed each other at least once, at least once in that whole Quite possibly. Thing. Where did you hang out in LA? Uh, probably North Hollywood the most, I would say. Maybe not then, because I spent a lot of time on the West Side. So my my jams in L.A. were uh, towards the end. I mean, from from about t- 2008 until when I left in 2013, um, I spent a lot of time at Literati Cafe on Bundy and Wilshire and Amandine Cafe at Wilshire and Bundy also. This is my neighborhood. Uh, I went to California Chicken Cafe in Santa Monica, Whole Foods in Santa Monica. These are like food spots, obviously. <laughs> um, I spent a lot of time at Will Rogers State Park uh, in Palisades where I would hike and read. And they had like a, a, it was like for anybody in Los Angeles, Will Rogers State Park is the nicest spot. It has the best hiking. It has this beautiful green belt. They do polo there in the summer. You can like, just go and watch polo. You can watch Malibu versus Palisades and polo. Like how upper class can you possibly feel watching yeah. malibu versus palisades and polo um yeah i mean I, 
though I I went to Hollywood sometimes, but I think you know people stay in their bubble. You know, not you because you weren't in North Hollywood. Um, but yeah, I had I had some plays like I to this day I remember very fondly. Good spots. Uh, in closing, I want to look you dead in the eye while I do this. Uh, Seth, I and everybody that I brought over enjoyed the film. That's that's straight up. There's no. I'm just telling you this, like, and, and honestly, I was most afraid of kind of I, afraid's not the right word. I was more um, afraid of getting upset at my girlfriend because she didn't find it as funny as <laughs> I did. Um, and and I she, appreciate that. She was laughing out loud. It, but listen, it, the sad fact is, like, you know, it may have been 20 years ago at this point, but I still think you have something that's relevant today. I still think that it's weird enough, like you said, to where I don't know that you can, with the exception of maybe like technical aspects, I don't think the content feels dated at all, especially even watching it, like I said, twice in the past few days. I I don't feel, I'm not like going, all right, let's wait for, like the scenes that I know I'm waiting for it. Like there, that's another thing too. I think you wrote something that moves in a way that not a lot of films were moving that day, like in terms of the beats. Again, this mm. just this could be me, and I'm you know infatuated with you. I don't fucking know at this point, but but to <laughs> me, you, you made something that stands the test of time. The story works, the comedy works, it's relatable, and like I said, I don't just say this because we're on the mic together. I you know listen to my other shit, but after having a small viewing party where everyone laughed, everyone had a good time. And yeah, it's amazing. Thank it's, you. It That's sparked. Nice yeah. It sparked a conversation, which again, like I, like I had mentioned at the top of the show, it wasn't anything. It wasn't just like the most intellectual conversation. I mean, at the end of it, it was like, fuck fast food, fuck the rich and fuck, you know, like, <laughs> I mean, but the fact of the matter <laughs> is like, you're still invoking that emotion, sir. So that's, it. that's not something that you should take lightly. And I, and I don't, I'm not trying to pull you back in. I know you have this life now that you're loving, but I, I'm just going to say one other thing to you before I let you go. I don't like the idea of you being on the shelf. So I, I know that that's, it's I, just straightforward, man. Like this is now two films that I, I don't know. I just think somebody throws $2 million at you. And I think, that you make something I, just well. I think you. I think you're a filmmaker. That I, I, I hesitate to use me as an example, but like someone that kind of got chewed up in it. Like you know, it's a story that it's a yeah. story as old as that's time. accurate. Yeah, that's like accurate. chewed up, spit out, and like, mm -hmm. and unfortunately, people like you and I. Well, you're more successful than I am, but that that's that's not an uncommon story you know and it's mm -hmm. when i talk to people like yourself i just go this doesn't make any fucking sense to me like there was enough yeah. in takeout enough in brian loves you that if i was perhaps you know an i iranian gangster with a lot of money i would i would throw you you know a few uh, wooden nickels and see if you can't uh, make a profit, turn a profit for your boy. So appreciate that. I mean, something I will say is, I mean, I I'll always have a connection to, I mean, a couple of places, one New York is I'm from there and two LA because I really grew up there. And, you know, like my, I think at my heart, I'm an artist, regardless of what I do in my life and career. You know, I think people are kind of like the essence of something and, and that is just what I am. Um, and, uh, you know, I still, I think for the rest of my life, I'll have a lot of, uh, good friends and family in that town. And there are off the top of my head, one, two, three, four, four, uh, independent filmmaker types. And I know they're still there that have been there the entire time I was there and they're still there and they have different degrees of success. One guy is a award-winning music video guy. He's trying to be a film guy, but he's, you know, making progress here and there. Another guy is a lifelong comedian who's like that close to getting his stuff made, you know, cause he he attaches people and like some of the money's there, not all the money there. And, and, uh, one is just a true independent filmmaker who does make things just very sporadically. Um, so you never know what's going to happen. I mean, I, if it, if it helps you at all, I mean, I, I definitely still have, you know, reach there. And, you know, I think, I think when you're part of a community, then 
it's not like something's off the table. There's always a potential that you can get pulled back in, you know, um, you never know, but, um, but I, I didn't, I never shut the door because it's more than just a vocation and a profession. It's a life. And so I spent so much time there doing so much work and meeting so many people and giving so much of myself. I mean, I, I've literally had every job on a, on a set almost like where everything from PA to producer, um, for different levels of film, TV, um, web, just all, all kinds of productions. Um, and I think when you spend more than a decade working almost like seven days a week, it'll never leave you. So you never know. It, it's, it's always there. You just don't know when something tangible will come of it. Damn, that would be a good place to end it, but I'm obnoxious. I think maybe you and I, I don't know, off air, maybe we should start kicking around some ideas, dude, because with your smarts and my idiot, there's something there that we could <laughs> like, there's something there just based on like the conversations that, you know what, Sean, don't go on a tangent. This man just said something fucking good, a good way to end the show. And you're going to bring up fucking personal gain you're well let me throw one more thing in there but no i mean of course i'm open to that because we're you know in contact and you can always reach out for anything of course um, Merry christmas and i was like very hesitant to do that and now that i know no need <laughs> yeah, not... you, can, you can oh are you saying are you saying because uh we hadn't been in touch for a while or because it's christmas and i'm no i think Jewish. i just yeah well that... i like all religions <laughs> i'm a man of all religions sean but like, I mean, because here's the thing, like you saying that as soon as you were just like, I'm Jewish, like, blah, blah, blah. I went, oh, my God, I wish this man Merry fucking Christmas last year. You fuck. Oh, no, 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 no. Like, I, I, I say that, like, facetiously. It's like, I, I mean, I am technically, but like, I just don't I don't feel like you fit into like the masses when you're like when you grow up and people are like kind of poking you and prodding you and asking questions about you. And like, it's just so uncomfortable. So you, the point is, you don't feel like the mass because you're always like you know, ask questions or treated weird and and like people know whether they can feed you ham or pork or it's like what what am i an animal you know <laughs> or am i a man no no um, you hate chain restaurants you hate all of that stuff you no one's feeding you any chicken or beef or I, like that. I like a good fast casual i'll say that like there was some good like uh in la it was california chicken cafe here in uh phoenix you know wherever you live there's always there's a way to do food a little bit more rapidly, but it doesn't have to be like doused in oil and sugars and the salts. And, you know, there, there's a way to do it. It's, it's the most popular ones, the ones that are cheapest and most ubiquitous tend to be like the shittiest food. That's why they are ubiquitous, because they're a business that's highly profitable. Why? Because they have a large audience and they spend nothing on their product. So, you know, their margins are huge. Hence, they can spend... $10 billion a year advertising on TV and then with every major sport and, you know, just, but one thing I will say is this, yeah, uh, not to backtrack, but this is what we do. So one of the first questions you asked that I didn't respond to is like, do you feel like you were like maybe blackballed because of some of the content? And I, I appreciate the fact that you brought that up because I never in a million years thought of that, not a million years. I've never in 17 years thought about that. I, I never thought that what I made was that edgy because I just thought like, this is my life. You know, and this is just like making a broad comedy, poking fun at some things that are kind of ridiculous. And and to that point, I remember when Idiocracy came out, uh, and I think Mike Judge is genius, you know, um, and, and he he received that blowback. Granted, he was, you know, a, a known entity. So obviously, if he makes a movie, it's going to get pushed out. But I remember reading several different things, excuse me, and hearing stories about how Basically, Fox kind of like really didn't publicize it because it, I mean, it mocked, I think it was Fox Studio that it was made at. It openly mocked Fox News. So, but it, it's the same thing. I mean, it, it's the same kind of concept where you're kind of like making a really strong statement, even if it's through comedy. And I think I was trying to make the statement that this stuff is funny more than anything. I, I think I was, I think I was just trying to make people laugh, but could people have read it the way that you said? Quite possibly. I mean, that could have been a factor. Some, some, the whole room, sir, the whole room was like, oh man, like, and cause I, I explained to him, I was like, he shot this then. It's just now, you know, well, not just now, but it hit a streaming service almost 20 years later. And they're like, <laughs> they almost so looked, they, they almost looked at me like, well, yeah, 
did you watch the fucking movie? And 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 I had thought that prior, like interesting, because you just went. I think because of the scope that we talked about earlier, like, and I, and again, like who the fuck knows, but I, I'm not saying that any one person that you pitched it to or the festivals or anything like that was like, no, he's going after fast food. I'm not saying everybody did that, but mm. I think you'd be silly to think at least one or two or five or 10 went, no, 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 no. We're not too, we're... too, uh, too, uh, strong subject, too much of a, what, what, what would you call it? Not offensive necessarily. Just like, don't come um, after our money. Don't come after our money, sir. Maybe political, even though it wasn't politics per se, but political in a sense where it's um, big business, maybe. There's a part of me that thinks that that conversation on the golf course is happening right fucking now, dude, between two people that are that are looking for the, the crispest hundred dollar bill. I believe that. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, I think. Part of the fun about writing comedy is you can just write the craziest shit that comes to your mind. And that's, and, and Brian loves you. So that was more suspense. You have to kind of keep it a certain level of serious. And, and after making takeout, I remember when I made Brian loves you, I was really interested in doing something that wasn't funny at the time. I remember thinking, I'm really relieved that I don't have to be funny right now, um, that I can be serious. And, um, I don't know. I mean, I, that was just because I had just made takeout but um, but to me, that's the most fun is writing comedy because it's like I my whole life, even when I was reporting for newspapers, I would like write stuff on the side as a joke and pass around the newsroom and see what kind of reaction it would get. When I was in college and I had uh, broadcast journalism writing courses, I would always go funny with it just to see how the, you know, instructor or professor would, you know, would feel. And and uh, yeah, I mean, there's it's so when you talk about that scene on the golf course, I just thought like. What is the most ridiculous thing that somebody would say? Um, being bored with a hundred dollar bill because it's not perfect, so you just like you rip it up because it's no good. I mean that that's the beauty of comedy. I mean you could you could be just like as, more creative, I think, than almost any other genre. Yeah, yeah, comedy, comedy and horror for sure. Um, yeah. Hey, can we do this again? Can we? Can we? Yeah. Can we fuck around again? And we got to review something else. Let's review Long Gone or something. Maybe not Long Gone. That's kind of like eh. there were some cringy <laughs> elements of that movie. Yeah, I um, think but... you and I are due for another three-hour podcast. I think you and I are due. Let's find a movie. Let's yeah. find a classic movie that's like classically underrated, but also patently good. Uh, we great. just we just did one. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> just let the silence just let the silence just I'm like, in. wait, which? Oh yeah. Take out. Uh, I don't even put my movie in there uh, uh, until somebody like really puts it on, you know, right in front of me like that. So I appreciate that. Sir, pleasure as usual. I am gonna Likewise. chuck you deuces. Thanks uh, for having me. I thought I, I thought takeout was good. I can attest that other people that were with me uh, thought it was good. And um, just a goddamn mensch, this guy. A mensch, I tell you. Takeout, no excuse. Streaming on Tubi as we speak. It's free. It's free. What? It's free. And how about you just see it based on the merit of that dude alone? Isn't that dude great? I fucking love Seth. And you think I'm fucking around by maybe doing some business with him, maybe working on something later. And it's just a testament to his character. Anyway, Ellis Cinema, Seth Landau, take out, take out on Tubi right now. And maybe you'll see Seth and I uh, shortly down the line here. Ellis Cinema, take out, Seth Landau, we gone. <laughs>